Hello everyone and welcome to the third webinar of our updated CISP short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward, IT Masters short course MC, back after a, a week's reprieve for you lot uh, during my reign of short course terror. Uh, your mentor as usual is the lovely and talented George Thomas and, and thanks to Chantel for covering me last week. Before we begin, the usual housekeeping. Uh, we encourage questions and the use of chat, of course, during the webinar. Uh, please direct all questions relevant to course content to the Q&A section and everything else to Hannah and Kit in the chat. You can chat privately uh, or with panelists or all, the, all of us hosting it uh, or to your fellow students as a, as a group. And you can make that choice by toggling through the drop down box once you've opened the chat log. You can also hide it in various ways if you don't like it. Anyway, I think you should use it. There's there's some very experienced industry um, embedded attendees, so to speak, who will, I think, be most helpful with any simple queries you might have, um, which is, I think, especially useful for this course. We'll have a Q&A session at the end, um, but if a, if a question is particularly relevant, I'll interrupt you, George, sorry. Hannah is responsible for the course page, learn.itmasters.edu.au, and you can find all of the other course resources there. Um, and probably more than you, you need. The forums are going really well. Um, I've pinned a couple today, uh, just of sort of pathways uh, into a cyber cyber career, um, whether you're already you know, in, a, in an IT a job or, or just looking to get into it. I think there's heaps of ways you can look at it and a couple of th threads will, will be really helpful. Um, other than that, um, thanks for contributing. How you doing, George? We'll bring you in now. How have you been? What tales of the last couple of weeks? Uh, yeah, thanks, Guy. Um, just busy, 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 busy. I don't know. It's been a crazy start to the year, I think. Only been back, what, two weeks and flat out. So, oh, no. um, yeah, I know. So, so uh, yeah, sort of um, uh, any any penetrations or anything of your... Uh, uh, no, just um, mainly consulting work. But, yeah, just, just a lot of it um, with, you know, a lot to do in not a lot of time. But mm -hmm. that's fine. Um, but, yeah. So, um, yeah, been good otherwise. Just, you know, admiring the very odd weather that we've been having. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, I guess we should get started. Or, yeah. Let's do it. All right. Cool. So, um, what are we in? Week three? Yeah. So, today we're going to cover off um, domains four and five. Um, might have a little bit of a, 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 a tinker just for a bit of change of scenery so that, you know, it's not complete. Um, death by PowerPoint today. Um, so yeah, I think we might as well get started and I'll kind of just skip over the text. Once again, as I said, if anyone that's looking to do um, the exam, um, you know, I, I definitely recommend picking up at least one of the texts. Um, doesn't necessarily do this one, but this is the one that the contents um, sort of, you know, mainly sort of pulled from. So anyway, domain four. Um, so domain four is communication and network security. So, you know, we're going to start off with, um, and I'm sure many of you are probably thinking it in your heads right now, um, the OSI model. So, you know, pretty important. In fact, I, I remember when I sat the exam, it was probably the first thing that um, I, you know, because, you know, the nerves kind of get to you sometimes and I quickly just jotted it down. When I say I got to jot it down, obviously I couldn't bring anything into the exam, but you know, it was like just to make sure I didn't like, you know, mess it up. Um, so the RSI model is a um, uh, sort of, you know, represents the, the sort of different layers within in, in networking, um, starting from, you know, that that um, you know, physical layer. So the actual, you know, you know, uh, electric sort of, you know, the, the cable that, that plugs in, um, kind of working its way up all the way to layer seven, which is the application layer. Um, and so, you know, when you think about, um, you know, the, the sorts of things that you're interacting with as a, you know, like as a, as a user of technology, typically you're going to be in, in, in layer seven. Um, and I know some people will sit there and think, oh, isn't there like a layer eight, which I, you know, I've heard before, um, layer eight being that, you know, human organization layer, but, you know, for the purposes of, of this, um, we sort of focus on the, on the seven layers. Um, <clears throat> so it's really important to know these and to know what order that they're in. Um, there's some really useful kind of acronyms that people um, have, I guess, invented at some point. Um, I know that the one that, and maybe people have put it in the chat. I mean, I can't see it, 
Um, but, you know, I, I've seen the, um, you know, please do not throw sausage pizza away. Please do not throw sausage pizza away. Um, as in obviously representing physical data network, transport session, presentation and application. Um, the one that I had, I think, because at the time that I did my CSSP, I was in the US um, and, and this was in the, I think the ISC squared official text at the time was, um, and funnily enough, was the other way around, was all presidents since Truman never did pot. But anyway, whatever works, um, you know, that's a, a really good way to, um, to kind of, you know, to memorize that and, you know, just make sure that you, you understand what's in, or what the layers are, and then what's in, um, or where things fall um, within, within those specific layers. And we'll, we'll touch on that, um, in a, in a little bit more, a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. uh, so definitely recommend. <clears throat> I think I, I'm, I'm going to say I'm, I definitely emphasize being across this model. Yeah, and uh, even if the if the mnemonics are uh, completely untrue, because they all uh, tried it but didn't inhale. Um, and also, Andrew sent in the chat a priest saw two nuns doing push-ups. Very good work there. <laughs> A priest or two nuns doing push-ups. Yeah, that works too. <laughs> Whatever works. Um, <laughs> so to, to be honest, when I did the exam, I, I literally went in and just like, because you get that little bit of like scratchy board, right, with a, with a Sharpie. And I just went, duh, 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 and then it was like, cool. Now I've got that as a reference thing. And if I need it, then all good. So yeah, really useful. Uh, and then, you know, the other, the other model that's kind of widely used is the um, TCP IP model um and so obviously this only has four layers to it uh, and i'm going to do a, a comparison in a second um and so what how this works and this lines up with the osi model so you, you know you'll have like um application presentation and session aligning with application here transport and transport um network and internet kind of line up there and then data link and physical line up with link the link layer um and so what we'll do is we'll you know we'll, we'll talk about talk about this. Um, I guess the other thing is, um, you know, talking about uh, TCP IPs, we'll, we'll talk about things like, you know, like TCP handshake and, and all that sort of stuff as well. But just for a, a bit of a sort of side by side, um, this is how the, the two models kind of, I guess, align. To be honest, I think the OSI model is more commonly referred to um, and, and used. I mean, I haven't had much use for, or, yeah, I, I think, yeah, generally speaking, when we're talking about you know networks so and so forth um you know we, we tend to refer to the osi model um and so you know as i said you know talking about interaction with the the various um uh, uh you know like you know with like the various um layers i think layer seven um and, and i kind of bring this up there because you know it's it's probably something that you know, people can kind of relate to but you know common layer seven protocols are things like you know, Telnet, FTP, HTTP. Um, so, you know, uh, POP3, which is email um, and, you know, SNMP. So, but, you know, obviously there's other things in, um, I guess if, if I think about, and I'll probably show the other diagram up now, but I'm, I'm just thinking about like, you know, the other layers one to six. And so, you know, I don't think, well, probably good to be across them. Um, you know, if you, if you go all the way down to, um, you know, the layer one, um, then, you know, which is the physical layer and I've probably done this before, but, you know, thinking about things like this is where RJ45 might sit or, you know, 100 base, um, you know, that, that sort of layer would be layer one. Um, layer two is we kind of move into ethernet, um, 802.11, um, frame relay, that's sort of layer two. Um, layer three, you kind of, you know, looking at things like IPsec, ARP, um, IP, um, and then going into layer four, which is, you know, where TCP, UDP, SSL, and the sort of transport stuff, you know, like TLS um, will sit. And then, you know, going up to, um, you know, further up through 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 the layers. Um, and my memory's starting to fail me on what's in those other layers. But anyway, um, so yeah, just, just kind of be aware of those things. And I, th and I think, you know, as I said before, you know, TCP is probably going to play a pretty big part. And we'll talk briefly about, um, you know, TCP and, and UDP. Um, so one of the key things around, you know, TCP is the whole concept of the, the three-way handshake. So, you know, TCP is a connection orientated, um, protocol, um, and it's used to establish a reliable connection. And so we've got this 
three-way handshake that occurs when a TCP connection is established, um, which is this, and I'm sure some of you have heard of this before, but the, the SIN, SIN, ACK, ACK um, three-way handshake. And so the way that it works is a SIN um, flag is sent to the destination. The destination server responds with a um, SIN, ACK flag and then an, an ACK, so um, synchronize and acknowledgement. And then an acknowledgement comes back. And then at that point, the, the three-way handshake is um, established. <clears throat> so just for fun, let's just see what that might look like. Why not? Set, got to have. So I don't, I don't know if uh, some of you have been to any of the other sort of um, like, you know, webinars or if any of you are some of the students that I've, um, that, that I've, you know, had in my webinars and, you know, I'm sure that many of you have seen some of the kind of more kind of hacking style demos. Um, now, not really relevant to CSSP, so hopefully this is still interesting. <laughs> but um, so, you know, Wireshark is a, um, it's a network analyzer. It's used to kind of, you know, analyze and inspect um, network traffic. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna basically just do a quick um, capture of some traffic and then um, we'll take a quick look at it, sort of. Yeah. So I'm just going to, does that work? I failed to see, ah, sorry, there we go. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to open up a browser over here, okay. So I, oops, I'm just gonna go here just cause I want it to go somewhere. I'll just click on something. Okay, cool. That's all I really wanted to do. That should be enough. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is, so what I've done is I've always, I've connected to a, a web server that's remote and I'm just wanting to see what, um, now I do know what the IP address of that web server is. So it's probably safe anyway, here yeah, it is. So I just want to filter it. Um, okay. So what I've done is um, I, I've filtered for packets that are going to and coming from that web server. And I guess the, the point here that I'm getting at is you can kind of see that three-way handshake being established at the start here. So you can see that. So 196.1.53 is me, um, the destination server. I mean, if you were to ping that web address that was up before, that's what would come back. Um, uh, or, or do an NS lookup or whatever. Um, and you can see that it sent a SYN flag to that server. That server has responded with a SYN ACK flag. And, and then my client has, as in this machine has then responded back with a, um, a acknowledgement. So that here, those sort of, oops, these three, this here is an example of that um, three-way handshake like that, that's happened there so pretty um pretty straightforward pretty easy um there's a little bit more going on here so i'm going to leave this open because we are going to talk about um things like um tls um shortly and we'll kind of break this down a little bit further after um but for anyone that's not seen the three-way handshake before and what it looks like and how it works um that that's pretty much it i guess the other thing is you know of, of interest in here is you know you can obviously break down into this and you can see other things like um you know the the sequence number so the sequence number rule is actually um something that's going to be used throughout the communication um you know as you kind of go further down so what's that 707 um so it'll be this one here 708 so you know the, the sequence number is used to kind of keep keep track of the order of the packets um, and the reason why I mentioned that is um, because, you know, there's some other flags that are in use here. So there are flags like, um, I don't know what's going on over here. Um, oh, there we go. So, you know, you've got like the urgent pointer, which is the URG flag. Um, and so, you know, this is, I guess, the scriber. So it, it's basically used to tell the, the system to immediately process the packet rather than looking at the sequence, which is kind of what I was getting at before. Um, push or PSH. So this is similar to um, the urgent um, pointer um, and it's used for, you know, prioritizing packets. Um, you've got reset or RST. Um, this is an interesting one. So this will reset the connection. Um, and this is often used by threat actors when 
trying to identify um, kind of um, you know to scan for, for for open ports. And so what happens is a threat actor will send something that a port um, or that a that a, 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 a service is not expecting. Um, and there's you know there's some conformities around here like RFC, which basically say that you know. So if you, you know, if you think about a um, you know the, the sort of sin sin act act sort of flow, um, you know if you send something that's not right, then the response to that would be to to sort of reset. And so a threat actor can use that to identify that there's actually something there, um, uh, even if it's not responding. So um, yeah, and then you've got the the fin or the finished finalized flag, which is used um, at the end. So, you know, there's some other, other flags that, that are there. Um, yeah, anyway, so that was like UDP. So the other one, um, so UDP, so user data gram protocol. Um, I won't see if anyone says it, I can't see the chat, but you know, you know what I'm gonna say, which is I tell you a joke about UDP, but you might not get it. Um, now, <laughs> I'm sure a bunch of you got that. Uh, maybe some of you didn't. Um, Some even uh, beat you to it in the chat. Ah, uh, <laughs> see, there you go. I was gonna say, normally it's you know it's normally it's guy that tells the jokes, but I thought I'd stick <laughs> one in there. Um, but yeah, basically it's connectionless, um, and it doesn't do the same three way. It doesn't have the the three way handshake. So the whole the whole joke about whether you get it or not is so you know UDP packets are transmitted. Um, there's no, I mean, there's no guarantee that. Um, they're going to be received. And there's no guarantee that if they're received that there's not anything wrong with them. Um, and so, you know, UDP does do error checking, but um, which TCP also does. But the difference is that if there's an error, the package is just discarded. So there's no resend. Um, hence, they, you might not get it or they might just not get there. Um, now, generally, or well, not generally, UDP is faster than TCP and it's often used for real time applications. So things like audio, video, um, you know, things that are real time and require faster connection will often be, um, you know, we'll, we'll usually use UDP. Um, I don't know if anyone's, uh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I would say anyone I'm thinking like, it's been, been in use for a while now. I'm sure everyone has experienced jitter at some point. Um, you know, on a phone call or, you know, I was on a, on a, a, a webinar before and, you know, there was kind of, you know, freezing frames and stuff like that going on. That's an example of where there's packet loss. Um, so, you know, there's a UDP packets going over, but some of them are kind of lost in translation, uh, lost in transit, sorry, you know, likely due to, um, you know, issues with the connection. Maybe it's, you know, slow internet or, or some sort of, you know, other disruption. Um, the point is that, that you know, some, where some loss is acceptable, you know, you might sound like a robot for a bit, or there might be like a word that cuts out, but performance is important. And UDP is usually um, the, 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 the protocol of, of choice. Um, so UDP. Um, cool. I see lots of like hand thingies and stuff. I don't know if we should pause for questions at any point, but because I can't see what everyone's saying. Or no, we should exchange when, when UDP have... jokes. <laughs> There's a lot of those. Um, now, when people put their hands up, we, we tend not to know what they're going to ask. So if you have any questions, any hands up, uh, just chuck your question in writing to the Q&A section, please. Cool. Um, so carrying on then. One of the, I guess, the key things um, with, well, networks, um, communications, the internet in general is um, DNS. So domain naming service. Uh, I'm sure once again, many, well, I'm going to say all of you are probably familiar with this. You've used it in some way, shape or form, I'd say. Um, but basically, um, you know, it's critical. So it's worth discussing. Um, I, I was going to say the other thing with UDP is it, it, it allows really small transactions um, as well. And so it's commonly used, well, it is used, it is used for DNS. Um, and so, um, you know, that's um, how DNS data is transmitted using um, UDP. However, zone transfers um, will use TCP. Um, so, because you don't want those to be you know, corrupt and you want some sort of um, reliability there. So if we look at um, DNS, I think people are most familiar with you know, internet domains. So, you know, your .coms and your .orgs and your .net and your .com.au's, your .net.au's, .org.au's, all those sorts of things. So those .coms, .orgs, 
.NETs, they're, um, you know, they're called TLDs or top level domains. Um, and then, you know, below that where you've got your .com, you know, usually an AU or, um, you know, .co.nz or whatever, um, you know, they're gonna be your second level domains. Um, the other um, common sort of, I guess, you know, in terms of internet domains are the uh, subdomains. So that's where you've got your, I don't know, example.com. And then there's a, usually like a host name that sits in front of it, like a, um, you know, I don't know, have fun.example.com would be um, an example of a, a subdomain. So, you know, the common records that are used in DNS, and we'll kind of walk through these um, now, uh, A records, um, C names or canonical names, text records, MX records, and um, name server records. And so, once again, just make it a little bit more interesting. Um, let's see if we can, that is tiny. Uh, give me a second. Where is it? Bigger. That's not really bigger. Bigger again. Can we read this? Can we read that? It's quite Oops, small. Is it? <laughs> That's larger. Oh, no, the text. Can you read the text? The text is still small. Yeah. How are people going in the chat? Because, you know, I have terrible eyes. How about now? That's pretty good. Surely. Good this end. People are fine. Okay, cool. So, um, NS Lookup is a, is a good tool for this. Um, now, there's obviously online things like, you know, MX Toolbox and all that sort of stuff as well. And, but, you know, I like old school NS Lookup. So, NS Lookup is a tool that you can use to query DNS records. Um, and, you know, I'm going to kind of highlight why this is important. Um, so, apart from the fact it's useful to verify your DNS records, um, it's actually very useful to verify your DNS records. It's also used as a, um, a method of, you know, what, 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 you know, can, what's called open source intelligence. So, you know, a threat actor um, looking to identify, um, you know, what type of email system you might use or something like that. So, you know, an MX um, record, uh, sorry, a DNS record might be a way that they could do that. I mean, anybody could query anybody else's DNS records. In fact, that's how the internet works. So, you know, if I want to send um, email to wherever, um, my sending mail server would, would do a, a lookup to work out where to send it. And so just, um, I'm just going to use Cloudflare. Um, so are these all reports? What's that later? Might be later. Um, so I've just, so I've just set it to wonder, 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 wonder. I'm just, you know, many of you might know that's Cloudflare. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I might want to look at an MX record. So, you know, where is mail going? Um, I'm just going to put my domain in because I don't mind. And you could see here that I could that, uh, and, and so this is where I've been a bit sneaky. Um, I'm using um, PPE, which is um, proof point. So you can't see ex exactly what email server I'm using, but, um, but you know, you'll, you'll find that, you know, uh, when was that? Well, it's still currently going, but a lot of threat actors have worked out that by, you know, doing a um, MX lookup, they can work out who's using like, you know, Microsoft 365, and then they can target attacks that way. So anyway, you know, that's obviously something that's pretty hard to, um, to stop. I mean, obviously you could put something like this in front of it, um, but you know, there's MX records. If I wanna, you know, do a, um, if I wanna look at A records, um, I can, you know, look at where, uh, you know, web servers are, are sitting. Um, I can yeah, query those different types of things. Um, you know, if I want to do a uh, text, I can look at you know things like SPF records and stuff like this. So it's a really good troubleshooting tool as well. So you know, if I'm, you know, the people are complaining that all you know the mail always goes into junk or whatever like that, um, chances are it's probably some sort of SPF issue. Um, and so you know by doing this, I could see what um, what servers are allowed to send. Um, email on behalf of my domain. So, um, but yeah, as I said, this is all, this is kind of considered that sort of open source sort of, you know, intelligence and recon because this is all publicly accessible. Um, so obviously be you know, very careful about um, making sure that, you know, DNS is, is sanitized, things like that. But I guess my point is that um, how quick and easy it is to look at that sort of stuff. Uh, I've done it before. Um, so, and yeah, and then you've got other sort of, you know, threats to, um, 
through DNS, like things like DNS poisoning and spoofing and all that sort of stuff. So being able to, and if you think about it, if someone's able to manipulate, um, you know, what IP addresses are, are you know, return and things like that, um, that can, you know, create a bit of a, bit of a, bit of a threat. So, yeah, so DNS is pretty important. Um, yeah, I know we kind of just blow through this content really quickly. Um, so yeah, if you've got questions, please um, ask them in the in the Q and A or in the discussion forums. And yeah, I've been trying to get through there. Um, so IPv4. So you know, when we think about um, you know IP addressing schemes. Um, you know, traditionally it's been um, IPv4. So version four of um, the IP address scheme. So 32 bits, um, as it suggests there, what is that? 4 billion? 4 billion, 294 million, 967,296 addresses. Um, one of the you know, key issues with that um, is that uh, we kind of ran out of IP addresses. So, um, and obviously, you know, as more of the world gets connected and all this sort of stuff, um, that becomes a, a big issue. And so NAT is, um, so network address translation is the solution to that. Uh, well, sorry, it's not the solution to that, sorry. It's often used and, you know, it means that, um, you know, one external address can be used and um, for, for multiple sort of devices. Um, and so if you can imagine you've got to listen, um, wind, um, basically using NAT, um, you know, if you're like home router, for example, you would probably have a, you know, a single IPv4 address, well, depending on which ISP you're on, um, and then your your devices will access um, the internet, and it'll be being added. And you can create rules and stuff, and you can, you know, depending on ports and that, you can route traffic using 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 that. Um, so, you know, IPv6, you know, support for that um, has, you know, it's starting to kind of take hold. I think more and more organisations are either moving to IPv6. A lot of the ISPs are supporting IPv6. Um, the address space is much larger. It's 128 bits. I don't even know what that number is, um, but you know the the idea is that there is an IP address for everything. Um, you know, there's there's no no NAT um, within IPv6. Um, so and you know it's considered to be um, you know more secure. Um, there's also um, you know the routing information is actually contained within the IPv6 address. So, um, and you've probably seen the IPv6 addresses. I don't, I don't have one here, but you know, an example of one, but you know, they could be quite long. So, you know, there are obviously ways to, there, there are ways to shorten that. So, you know, like removing zeros and things like that. So um, I guess be familiar with it. Um, I'm not really sure how many questions there are gonna be in IPv6. I think just knowing the kind of fundamentals around IPv6 is probably a good start. Um, I'm sure you don't have to remember that there are 3.4 times 10 to the power of 38. Um, unique IP addresses, but at least knowing that they're 128 bit in length is um, probably a good start. So, um, there's, a, there's a question about uh, IPv6, IPv, IPv6 versus IPv4 um, from Abdul Rahman. Is it recommended to configure one versus the other in terms of security? Are there any security implications when you use one over the other? Yeah, so look, I, I think that. Um, Look, it depends on use and obviously the equipment that you use also has to support IPv6. Um, you know, the benefit of um, IPv4, I think, is probably NAT um, rather than having, you know, a directly accessible IP address. And then that's not to say that there's not internal IPv6 addresses as well. Um, so, yeah, look, it's I think it really depends on on use case um, and, and, and sort of, you know, that you know, what's available to you. I, I think that um, many organizations still use IPv4. I mean, it's, you know, pretty well adopted and, and, and tested, but we're starting to run into those limitations. Um, I think it's, um, you know, I, I think IPv6 is, is sort of touted as a more secure, um, uh, probably not the right word, but it, as more secure. Um, so yeah, it's really up to, to the organization and as i said not everything supports it yet so that's the other the other challenge so you know depending on the organization like if it's a, a an organization that needs to upgrade to ipv6 it might be a large undertaking as well yeah yeah i can imagine all right thanks um might um, do a few questions at the end of uh, the next couple of slides before we get into the next domain okay cool so um and then the other thing is you know uh protocol security 
So, you know, looking at, and look, PAP, CHAP and EAP, um, they're probably not used um, as much anymore. I think it's probably good to, to um, uh, be aware of them. Um, so extended access protocol, EAP, um, CHAP, challenge handshake authentication protocol, and I can't remember what PAP stands for. Um, Edo2.1x is still used quite heavily, I think. Um, so Edo2.1x, um, you know, is that sort of like port authentic or port authentication. So if you think about, um, you know, in, in for example, um, networks where you're, um, you know, you want to restrict the ability for anybody to connect and kind of look talking about port security, but if you, you know, and best practice would be too. So best practice would be to prevent anybody from just plugging into a port and gaining access to the network, right? And so in order to do that, you, you need to do something. Um, so the, the, you know, the recommendations would be to shut down the port if it's not in use, uh, but also, in, in, you know, um, configure something like port security and like 802.1x authentication. Um, and so what that means is that unless that machine is authenticated, um, like, like as in port authenticated, it won't get access to the network. And then you've got other things that can sort of add to that, like, um, you know, network access control. Um, you know, I think Microsoft had their network access protection, which I think it's gone by the wayside a little bit. I think they're doing, I'm going to have to double check that. But um, but yeah, it was NAP and NAC. I think, you know, obviously NAC's still around, but, um, but you know, authenticating um, at that network level, um, you know, not just plugging in and then trying to, you know, um, you know, and then having people authenticate to network resources. It's sort of that step before that. Um, anyone that's, you know, kind of looked at or has used in, you know, um, WPA2 Enterprise or WPA3 Enterprise, but, you know, um, for, for wireless security. So using that enterprise um, security rather than the pre-shared key password, um, you know, we'll, we'll be using, um, you know, these types of, um, you know, authentication protocols. So, you know, definitely the, the, the sort of stronger approach than, you know, sharing passwords and definitely the stronger approach than having no security on the port um, or just shutting it down. So, you know, that you would take that multi-pronged approach of shutting the port down and enabling, you know, port security um, and authentication on the port. Um, so the other things are things like, you know, quality of service, um, so QOS. Um, so that's obviously making sure that there's a minimum amount of service level for and available capacity for um, network traffic, which, you know, especially when we're talking about things like UDP earlier with potential drops, if there's you know, like network congestion and having QoS would help to prevent that. Um, and then, you know, securing voice communication. So what we're seeing a lot more now, I think, is people using, um, you know, sort of, you know, encrypted um, encryption mechanisms to, in, to uh, secure voice. So, um, you know, things like transport layer security and so forth. Um, and we're about to get into that TLS in a moment. So in terms of one of the other key things, and you know, there's been a lot of, uh, what do you call it? You know, like ransomware attacks and business email compromise. I mean, it continues, right? Um, and, you know, uh, threat actors trying to break into remote systems, especially with everybody you know, a lot of people, sorry, I think it was everybody at some point, but now, you know, but still a lot of people working remotely um, is, you know, making sure that remote connection security is adequate. And so, you know, we obviously there's that authentication layer where you, you have your credentials to try and log in, but, you know, I guess the, at least at a bare minimum now, it is an expectation um, and certainly a, a good practice that multi-factor authentication or two-factor authentication, so MFA, 2FA, um, is installed. Um, and so here, you know, when we talk about um, MFA, um, and this usually in, in, in sites questions as well, um, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, two or more of the following. So something you know, something you have, and something you are. Um, so something you know is usually going to be a username or password. I mean, that's something you know. Something you have is going to be something like, you know, physical, and I'm just kind of having a look around because I had a UB key floating around. But um, so something you have is something that is physically in your possession. So whether that be a, 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 like a UB key, or, uh, you know, one of those RSA tokens, which I probably have floating around as well, or whether it be an authenticator app on your physical mobile phone, um, that would be considered something that you have. And then finally, you'll have something that you are. So that really lends itself to biometrics. So something that you are, I mean, I guess you aren't your eyeballs, but 
um, or your fingerprints, but that is you, right? So there is that whole, um, uh, you know, retina scans, palm prints, fingerprints, voice recognition, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, you for anyone that's, uh, you know, called the um, Australian tax office or, um, you know, you, you probably, you know, had to speak that phrase that you um, should make sure that no one caught you saying. Um, <laughs> uh, same with some of the banks, right? So that's an example of something you are with, with biometrics. Um, and so two or more of those would um, be considered um, multi-factor auth. So, um, you know, and the theory there is that, you know, when we've got um, issues like, you know, credential stuffing or brute force attacks, that if a threat actor were to be able to obtain valid credentials, um, they would need that second or third factor to be able to successfully authenticate um, into whatever system. And so, you know, that was a, um, and, and, you know, it still is an issue with systems that don't have that because, you know, threat actors will conduct a successful phish attack. They'll leverage those credentials. They'll use that. Uh, password reuse is a pretty common thing where you know, people reuse the same passwords for multiple systems and then a threat actor will just see where they can get in. Um, obviously, MFA is going to make it a lot more difficult. By no means bulletproof, um, and I, I have a bit of a, a bit of a little bugbear. Um, I like the whole push notification where it says, "Oh, look, approved decline," but at the same time, I feel like it's a bit risky because someone would have to physically, well, sorry, someone is easy for someone just to go approved decline, opposed to someone having to physically like insert something or type in a code, where you know there's a little bit of time to think about it rather than just like, "Oh, did I do that?" or "Did you accidentally bump it?" or, or whatever. So. Um, you know, there are, uh, so MFA is not bulletproof and, you know, there, there are ways that it can be, um, which does involve more social engineering or, you know, accidental approval, but, you know, there's, there's still risk there. But, hey, it's a lot better than just the way it was um, and what people, um, you know, only had just username and password. I actually had a, a discussion once with someone slash tiny argument where they said, no, no, we have MFA. And I said, well, how they go we have to put in three things we have to put in uh username okay password yep cool and pin okay cool so do you know your username They're like yes all right something you know do you know your password like yes I'm like something else you know like do you know your pin They're like yes i'm like oh look three things you know explain how that's mfa and they went huh all right then, so how do we fix that? So, um, you know, just, just remember that it's distinct. <laughs> um, so um, just because it's three things, if you know all of them off the top of your head, um, then it doesn't count. Um, so encryption in transit. So I think the, the most common encryption in transit method um, nowadays is TLS, so transport layer security. Um, in fact, you know, I think I spent a good, I don't know how long now, several months configuring things like mandatory TLS for email server communication. Um, so, um, you know, web servers use TLS. The, the old school was, um, you know, SSL, um, so secure socket layers. You know, it's really funny when I see a website now that goes secure, with socket, secure socket layers. I'm like, yeah, that's kind of been, you know, vulnerabilities galore. I hope they've upgraded to TLS. Um, so TLS is the, the, the sort of, you know, what's the word, best practice approach to, um, encryption in transit um, and TLS 1.2 at a minimum. So 1.0 has, has you know, seen vulnerabilities as well. And so if we quickly duck back to this, um, wait, where do my wire shark go? Ah, here we go. If we quickly duck back to here. Um, and so, sorry, we'll quickly duck back to here and we will quickly take a look. I closed it, hang on. Right. So we've had our three-way handshake up here. And the next thing that's happened, so a TCP connection has been established with, uh, between the client and the server. The next thing that's happened is um, we have the client saying, client hello, TLS version 1.2. So now what's happening is it's doing a start TLS and starting to negotiate a TLS connection. Um, so in other words, the traffic that will be um, that will, you know, be from that point forward will be uh, encrypted. So if you look at develop tools um, and security, you can kind of see this. 
Um, so here you can see it's this valid HTTPS. So it still uses HTTPS as the as the um, you know, sort of um, uh, uh, like the prefix, um, but we're actually using TLS. So let's say TLS 1.2, elliptical curve, um, blah blah blah, key size 256, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then you can see the certificate. So you know this is this is TLS. So this this part here, where it's establishing that you get the padlock. Um, that is um, that is that is this happening here, and so you see this, you know, this, um, and we and we talked about um, you know handshakes and so forth, and and you know doing the um, asymmetric encryption to do the handshake ex uh, to do the the key exchange, um, and then um, establishing that symmetric um, encryption for the application um, communication moving forward in the application data. So you can see here. Um, if you go a bit further down, where is it? Uh, here, HTTP over TLS. So you can see here version 1.2. Um, so yeah, this is that um, that sort of negotiating the the TLS connection. And so at this point, everything between the client, as in the client being my browser, and the uh, web server being at the destination, is now secured in transit. So um, you know, at that point, um, someone it's going to be more difficult for someone to listen into that now obviously there's ways around that but someone would need to get in between and so yeah you see that in some organizations that do inspection of traffic like for dlp so data leakage or data loss prevention purposes uh, we did talk about dlp didn't we um where um you know there's something like a they call it ssl decrypt it works with tls2 where the traffic is decrypted inspected re-encrypted and then sent on but obviously you know there needs to be something implanted in between that's obviously very very difficult obviously at that point that that the you're going through infrastructure that you know maybe a, like corporate infrastructure or so forth um obviously threat actors they have their own ways of trying to do things like that like tricking you to you know into connecting into um wait that's not it like you know you see this i think not like one of these things so this is a um that's a, that's a like a, a pineapple so a, 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 it's not actually a but this is a pineapple but it's not like the fruit but um so you know tricking someone into connecting to a you know like a rogue access point or, or something where they could do a man in the middle attack which is effectively what that corporate firewall is doing is doing a man in the middle decrypt inspect re-encrypt but obviously using that for nefarious purposes um but you know all things being good um that in um that that traffic would be encrypted um between the two points so um tls is the um you know the, the sort of standard way to do that uh, and as i said i see a lot of um, requests coming about for you know um, email servers so and, and interestingly um when we talk about encrypting email there's that whole encrypting it server to server and then encrypting it end to end and so with tls that will be server to server so that's as it's transmitted from you know organization a's email server to organization b um not from you know, Outlook client, Outlook client. So it's it's, it's just that. Um, and so, you know, we there's the the two types of encryption, uh, TLS encryption in mail servers being opportunistic and um, enforced. So opportunistic is for anyone that's, you know, wondering what those terms were. Opportunistic is the whole, um, we will try and do TLS, but if it fails, we'll go back to clear text, e.g. unencrypted. Um, enforced is if we'll, we'll try encrypted. If it doesn't work, we'll just, to reject the message and it's not transmitted. So, but yeah, TLS is, is standard. We also see things like SIP over TLS. So SIP session is shared protocol, which is for communications. Um, that's also, you know, commonly over TLS as well. So as I said, TLS is the, the pretty much the standard now for encryption in transit. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah, I think that's it on that one, the main five. Let, let's get into some questions just while they're fresh. Uh... Eric asks, does TLS encrypt the connection or, or the data carried through this connection? Well, it encrypts the data going over the connection. So it's it's the data that's in transit. So as it's being, yeah, so as it's over the wire, um, it's encrypted. I think that helps. Eric, thank you. Uh, are there backwards compatibility issues with IPv6 we need to be aware of? Asks Ravu. Um, and, and Sarah is wondering how commonly it's used. 
So are there backwards compatibility issues? I mean, I, th I mean, look, I, I haven't had any issues, although I found there's a lot of, you know, IPv6 to IPv4 kind of, um, uh, what's the word? Oh, I, can't I can't think of the term. Um, uh, it's not routing. Um, look, obviously it needs to be set up correctly. Um, so like an IPv4 isn't going to directly talk to an IPv6 network without something in between. Um, so, so yeah, they're, they're not sort of backwards compatible as far as I know. Um, I mean, and I'm no, you know, I'm no CCIE or anything like that. So um, I might not be the right person to answer that. Um, but look, I, I don't, I don't think they're like directly backwards compatible, you know, like, you know, we can just, you know, like not just like downgrade something, like there needs to be sort of configurations that happen and, and, and that sort of translation that effectively happens um mm. and in terms of whether it's you know common i think it's becoming more increasingly common as i said a lot of the big networks like the, you know like you know like the telstra's of the world for example um have moved um as far as i know they've moved to ipv6 um and some of the larger organizations whereas you know as i said it's a fairly cost um uh, cost intensive exercise if your equipment isn't ipv6 um supported so yeah but then, you know, I said, I think there's still a lot of IPv4 networks out there, a lot of them, um, especially the, I think, especially the smaller ones. I mean, most of the networks I've worked in, um, I want to say worked in, like I said, I'm not the network engineer, but like they've been IPv4. But yeah, I think ISPs and those sorts of sort of organizations are, are, are moving and hosting providers and things like that, so. Okay, cool. Uh, just a couple on, uh, the, which slide was it? It was the domain naming service slide. Yeah. Just a, a couple of, um, I don't know, uh, go over a bit. Um, what's DNS SEC? And, and could you please explain DNS farming just a little bit? So hang on, was that what was DNS SEC? Yep. So DNS um, SEC, so it's DNS security. Um, basically, it it it, it, um, it adds authentication, so it adds authentication to to the lookups, um, and the I think the idea behind it is is, is it's meant to um, you know help prevent attackers from you know poisoning um, you know sort of the DNS requests. So when they poison them, they're effectively corrupted, and they can um, you know use that to kind of manipulate the response. So DNSSEC um, security extension um, helps to prevent. To prevent that if that makes sense yeah awesome thank you uh and just dns farming uh, to a term that don tippets would like a little bit more of an explanation of please don tippets is, the, is a short course uh legend by the way okay <laughs> um so you know in terms of um farming i, I think that's kind of like hijacking um so basically, it's, I think it's similar to, and look, I, I probably should have, probably should have, um, did I talk about that? I don't remember now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there was someone going to try and catch me out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just on the slide as one of the considerations. Okay. Yeah, look, um, so I'm just trying to think of a, a good explanation of, of, of um, you know, DNS farming. Um, I mean, it's, obviously, it's a DNS attack, and, and I think that it's really about trying to, I think it's, look, uh, I should probably double check this, so anyone please correct me, but I think it's around, you know, um, getting people to point to, like, you know, malicious DNS servers, I think. Um, so it's similar to, like, um, I mean, it's kind of like that sort of phishing thing, right, but it, it's, you know, and the idea is that by doing that and having control of that um, that server and tricking the person into using that as a DNS source, they can redirect them to like an invalid um, or a malicious website. I think that's what it is. Yeah. I feel free to put yeah, that in the chat. I think that's what it is. <laughs> broad, broadly, I think it's it's it certainly corresponds with what's coming into the chat now. And this is the the beauty of the chat, folks that are working in it and with it. Um, absolutely. It's definitely not anything to do with growing DNS servers. <laughs> yeah, otherwise my sister would be playing some shitty app game. <laughs> Farmville for DNSs. Um, 
Righty. Oh, uh, well, that was the, the ones that sort of came out of the that domain just then. Another few have come through, but I reckon we might just jump into the next domain and, and, and then have a, a larger one at the end. I think it's demonstrating a valid point that there is a lot of content in the CSSP <laughs> and you can't mm. remember all of it. Um, well, yeah, I mean, you, you can, but it's, it's tough. So, um, yeah. So identity and access management, um, I am. So, interesting. So, you know, I guess we'll talk about, um, that's that weird. I feel like that's in the wrong spot, but um, obviously very, very relevant having, wait, did we talk about physical access already? I feel like we did. Like today? No, no this, like, this, was, this was module one. Yeah, this is, yeah. This is a rogue oh, slide. Like it, oh, let's sneak it stuff in there. Cause I remember someone asked the question like about how yeah. there's less of a um, kind of, you know, emphasis on, on physical security, which yeah, funnily right. enough, like after that, something came to my mind, which is that physical oh, security is often, um, you know, when I say, you know, I guess the, the question was about, you know, there's less of a focus on it. And then I thought about it, I thought, you know, it's harder to physically get somewhere than it would be to get there over like the internet. So, hey, that was an interesting thought that kind of popped into my head afterwards. You know, when you have the whole, you know, the ability to connect to, to networks over the internet and be able to conduct an attack from basically anywhere in the world, um, when you compare that with physical security, um, much harder. Anyway, mm. that is why a rogue slide. Why, why invade what you can just do a cyber attack? Well, yeah, and then you've got jurisdictional issues as well. So, which then kind of lends itself to the, you know, the, some of the legal stuff earlier on. Um, and, you know, threat actors coming from, other jurisdictions can be um, harder, if not impossible, to track down and potentially prosecute. So, um, well, we'll anyway, it's later and say, well, we we purposely added this slide just as a as a yeah, I, yeah, it was just by luck. <laughs> um, so, identification authentication. So, identifying, um, you know, this is the process of of um, as a typo, claiming an identity. So, you know, this is saying I am George. Cool. So that's me identifying. Um, the authentication part is verifying that, and that's using, um, you know, the um, the credentials that I provide and those authentication mechanisms. So the authentication part is the you know, username, password, um, the MFA bits and bobs. That's that's the that's the second part of that. Um, and then after that, you know, we get authorization, which takes us to AAA. So not the people that come and fix your car if it breaks down. Is that AAA? I know it's RAC, whatever, but that's AAA, right, in America. Um, so authentication, authorization, and accounting. I know there's other, um, someone might have even put that in the chat. Once again, I can't see it, but um, I, I know that you know, there's been other slight variations of this, but it's basically it's the same thing. So authentication is verifying that identity. So as I said, um, you are who you say you are. So, you know, think of that as, you know, validating against an active directory. Um, something like that, or an octo or whatever. Um, and then authorization is where that subject, so the, the subject that's been identified is granted um, access to, to objects and things like, you know, you know, it's where group memberships come in and, and permissions and all that sort of stuff. And then the final part of that is accounting or the audit or auditing, I think it's sometimes called. So this is around, you know, holding subjects accountable. So basically saying, you know, this is, um, you know, this person's authenticated. Um, this is what they've accessed, and that sort of thing. So, being having that sort of accounting is is really really important. Um, and so, when we talk about, you know, authentication. Um, we talk about passwords, as you said. We talk about um, MFA, so multi-factor authentication, and also about things like, you know, password policies. Um, and so, um, you know, there's some guidance around that, like this this. NIST 863, um, PCI DSS has some requirements around that as well. Um, so password policies, just to kind of backtrack up there, um, you know, that's something that's critical. Um, you know, anyone that's, you know, worked in an active directory environment, worked or is currently working in an active directory environment, you know, you would typically configure your policies within that um, to have a minimum age, maximum age, complexity, length, and password history. So as I said, uh, now that varies between, um, and if anyone's asking me on opinions on, you know, those sorts of figures, um, I'm not gonna give them because I think it's really, uh, it, it, it does change and it depends on who you talk to. Um, I would definitely make sure that you kind of 
ensure that they are adequate. Um, but I'll tell you what each of these does, just, just you know, for the sort of for completeness. So minimum age is the minimum age that a password can be before you're allowed to change it. So if I think that's a bit weird, um, this is where I like interaction. I'd be like, now, why would that be important? Hey, Guy, I'll ask, ask, ask. Yeah, I've got why no would... idea. Uh, is it because I just make up stupid ones all the time and then forget them? No. So the reason why um, I encourage, and it's by default, I think it's set to zero, which is no minimum age. The reason why I always encourage setting minimum age is because people are clever. And what they do speak is, for yourself. <laughs> is they uh, it's it's and I've seen this happen. Someone will reset their password over and over and over again until they get back to the password that they started with. Yeah. <laughs> hey, gonna go, I'm gonna try that. I'm gonna try that. <laughs> so so you've got like this history that will say, like, you know, remember the last eight passwords, and I'll just change it nine times and they'll be back where they started. Brilliant. And when you do, when Thank you do a minimum you. when you do a minimum password age of zero, you're not making it so that they they can just do it straight away. So if you set a minimum password age of at least one, that's going to take them at least nine days, and that's like super duper annoying. So people won't do that. What they'll do instead, they'll just put an exclamation point on the end, and that'll be the end of it. But anyway, um, so but that that's what it does. So it kind of slows that that down a little bit. Um, Max. Maximum age is how old a password can be. So this is your usual password expiry. So once it hits, you know, 60, 120, 180, whatever days, that's the maximum age when you must change it. Complexity is, you know, upper, lower number, um, special characters in the Microsoft AD world. It's three out of the four. That's complexity. Um, once again, I'm not trying to sort of, and I'm sure many worked this out already, but I'm not trying to tell people how to get around these requirements. Three out of the four, I feel is a bit, bit can I say crap? Um, because it's like, you know, upper, lower number, um, symbol, special character, three out of the four. So if I do, uh, what are we, summer 2022 with a capital S, that's complex. Um, yeah, it's not really, is it? And meanwhile, everyone's like, oh, that's not a password. Um, there's always <laughs> someone that does it. There's always someone that does this season and the year. So I'm not going to get anyone to raise their hands if they've done that. Um, so, and then length is obviously length. Um, so here, you know, the longer the better, but obviously when I say that, you know, if you start enforcing 25 character length passwords, I'm sure you're gonna get a lot of resistance, um, but you know, generally eight to 12 is fairly standard, I think, but once again, depends what's suitable. And then history is how many passwords are remembered. Um, so, you know, generally I think default, I don't know default is, but I usually set that to something crazy like 24. So if I do 24, then it's gonna take someone 25 days to get back to their first password. And by that point, they've probably forgotten what their first password was. So um, yeah, that's um, some other stuff. So single sign-on, um, <laughs> single sign-on is basically using a centralized um, like SSO provider um, that allows, that, that will integrate with multiple systems so that you log in once um, and then you are signed in to all these other applications. And the benefit of that, there's a few benefits, but one of the key benefits is that, you know, maintenance. So if you, you know, if a person leaves or they get told to leave, um, you know, you disable it at one point and it disables it everywhere. Um, same thing, centralized um, uh, policies as, as well as um, less passwords to remember. So that is the, the sort of catch 22 is that one password would give them access to Will give it would give a you know uh, person access to everything so that could be a bad thing um <clears throat> i know that some platforms also allow the ability to you know enable mfa on every sign into like a critical system for a single sign on or something like that so there's you know definitely some considerations around that um and then federation is around um you know connecting multiple systems usually from different parties um you know together so that they can um interact you know, with each other. And that might be used like an organization maybe doing a merge, you might want to federate um, service together and, and that sort of thing. So once again, that just makes authentication a little bit more simple. Um, and yeah, so 863, um, I think there's, I forgot to mention, I think it's called digital identity guidelines. So, and PCI DSS, 
Um, that's the payment card industry data security standard. Um, so that's the, um, the, the sort of standard that um, um, for people that accept payments, but it has some you know, guidance in there around authentication as among, amongst other things. Um, cool, so RBAC, MAC, DAC, ABAC. So these are um, you know, different types of access control. Um, so RBAC, which is role-based access control, which is probably the one that I probably use the most. Um, so this restricts network access, um, you know, based on the roles of individual users. So for example, you know, exchange admins, that might be a, a role um, and, um, you know, domain admins. So it's kind of that. So you, there's a role that is created, that role, anyone that belongs to that, that role can do whatever it is um, in the, within the enterprise. Um, so, you know, if you, that's, you know, kind of, um, yeah, so that, that's sort of how that works. Um, so uh, I don't want to go through all of these, but, um, you know, mandatory access control is probably a good one. And um, we talked about that probably, I think that was in the first week as well. So this is about restricting access to resources based on sensitivity, you know, such as a label, um, you know, clearance. So that's, you know, quite widely used in, you know, government and, and military settings. So that's um, mandatory access control. Um, discretionary, um, that is, you know, based on um, you know, access, based on the identity of the subject. Um, and that's, I think with discretionary access control, that's, you know, probably one that's also quite widely used. We just kind of say, okay, well, this person can access this and this person can access this. Um, and then, you know, you've got things like, you know, risk-based access control. So, you know, that's based on um, an assessment of risk before providing access. So NAP would be an example of that. So, you know, the machine is high risk. Um, so therefore do or don't allow. Um, so I'm just looking at time. Um, it's not too bad. But... Nah, no, no. Um, cool. Uh, actually, no, I just realized there's like one slide left. Um, so the other thing um, that's really, really important is the whole concept of least privilege. Um, so in the security world, you know, uh, best practice is least privilege. So only providing the amount of access that is needed for a person to do their job. Um, obviously, this lends itself to things like privilege creep when, you know, people change roles and things like that. So that needs to be reviewed. That should be reviewed frequently. Um, automated if possible, automation is always better. Um, but you know that whole minimizing access um, and and giving access on a need to know basis to resources would be the um, the best practice approach. And so, in examples where people are in privileged positions, so for example, a system administrator, system engineer, or something like that, um, then you know least privilege would apply. So you know you probably some of you've seen this before. You'd have like a day to day account, and then when privileged operations are required. So for example, let's just say they need to do a backup or they need to, you know, run Active Directory users' computers in Active Directory environment, or they need to, you know, change firewall rules in a, in a you know, using in Linux or whatever, then using something like run as. Um, so, you know, in, um, uh, uh, you know, right click run as in Windows or you can do command line run as, um, or in, you know, Linux, Unix environments, um, sudo to escalate um, that, that next sort of process to be able to run as a higher level that would allow them to do that. Um, and obviously the idea there is they would also then, that, that would help you know, prevent the um, you know, threat actors from being able to, um, uh, to, to be able to you know, exploit that. So um, unless of course that threat actor then also managed to get a, a privileged account. But I guess the point here is if you know, someone downloads um, you know, malware, for example, and they run it and their account doesn't have full-blown privileges, then that's going to help contain that. Um, obviously, if they download the malware and then do a run as and run it as a domain admin, that's gonna be a bit of a problem. Um, but yeah, the idea here is that, you know, that helps to minimize the, um, the impact. So least privilege, least privilege is definitely um, something that, you know, one needs to be aware of and should be practicing, so. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, anyone that's got the book, it is chapter 12 to 14. <laughs> hmm. Do, have many people got the book? Just chuck it in the chat if you have. Yeah. About people 10. got the book, is it good? Yeah, let us know. And uh, we've got about what? 10 questions. Oh yeah. I got a, I got a question yeah. slide. Yeah, sweet. 
I'm not sure there must be so many bootleg versions as well. I don't know, maybe they have good security. Uh, let's get through some questions. Uh, let's go backwards. In the principle of least privilege, where does rules engine or RBAC fit? Uh, where was that? Oh, that was back here. Yeah. Was that back here? Yeah, uh, maybe the next slide. Uh, the next least, slide? least privilege that we're talking about? We're talking about least privilege or rules? Both. Like, what are we talking about? Do, do they fit together? Are they completely different? Uh, oh, yeah. Ra Raghu's uh, question the, at 8.34. Got it. And if it's a least privilege, oh, what is rules? What is rules engine? Or, well, so, I mean, rule, rules based rules based access is going to be based on specific rules. <laughs> So, um, so is that what you're talking about? So basically, you know, a system owner can personalize um, access that a user has, for example, based on specific rules, like maybe where they are, um, you know, what time of day it is, the, those types of rules. So, you know, in general, if you wanted to say, okay, well, if this person is outside of this particular area, then um, give them, the least amount of access that they need. Whereas if they're within somewhere, then do something else. So, same thing with role-based access. You would only assign roles that um, would allow them to do their role, so if, to do their job. So for example, you wouldn't give someone in um, help desk, for example, domain administrator rights. You would, um, you know, use, so in an active directory environment, for example, you would delegate them with appropriate rights that would allow them to do their role. So the least privilege there would be, you know, things like password resets, um, you know, maybe create a new account, but then you wouldn't allow them to like, you know, maybe, I don't know, to log into the server farm, stuff like that. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Raghu. Um, another one, actually. Um, why are identity and access management separated in that, uh, I guess, topic? Um, is, it, is it sort of like, well, are you talking about, uh, are they linked? Do they necessarily linked? And, and how would you describe them as different? No, no they, they are linked. Um, so one is about, uh, no, so it's identity access management, it's I am, right? So it's, it's, it's together. Um, the, so one is about identifying the subject and the second part is about giving them access. So one is, yeah, well, the first part, I guess, is around that sort of um, authentication and identity. And then the second part is, and then what, and then controlling access to what they have. So they're a bit, they're, they are different, but they do connect together. Mm. If that makes sense. Yeah, totally. And when you're talking about role-based things, it, it makes a heap of sense. Who, who gets access when? Yeah. Okay, let's go for Rudy. Uh, what access control is used in zero trust networks? Oh, and also, um, also, I will we'll cut off questions now, uh, please, Hannah and Kit. What access control is used in zero trust networks? So, well, maybe we could work through this one. Um, uh, where are we? So, if we look at this, so in, in a zero trust network, um, you know, you don't have uh, basically each device doesn't trust anything outside of, well, itself. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like that's probably going to be maybe, and look, hey, I'm up to discussion here. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like if I look at these, uh, you know, that may be rule-based. Um, you know, there, there may be, I mean, there's gonna be rules that allow you to, to do stuff. I mean, there's gonna be firewall rules and, and those sorts of things that are pretty, um, pretty well, you know, used in that environment. Um, is there, is there, anyone have any other thoughts on that? Mm, let's look through the chat. Like, I don't think it's role-based. I mean, obviously someone that's on that Al machine could, yeah, sorry. Alex is saying uh, the zero trust access control would be role-based. Yeah. Chat's been great tonight. Make sure you look through the log those later. It goes by who you are, reckons Alex. And then we've got Craig who thinks rule-based. Hmm. Maybe a good forum chat. 
those forums yeah, maybe. are going so great. Um, yeah. Um, so, uh, Rudy, could you please chuck that question in the module three discussion forum and we'll just set that one up as a, as a good one. I'll be completely honest. I haven't thought about it, which is kind of <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah. And this so, is the beauty of it. We've got, you know, 10,000 enrolled people in this. Um, let's lean on them. Uh, can I just answer that Ed's question there around um, how secure native password, browser password vaults. Um, and the only reason I'm going to ask that is, uh, is anyone, was anyone in um, uh, IT 516? I don't know. Is anyone? So um, yep, Daniel Thompson, Davo. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So maybe I'll let them answer what, what they think um, because it was um, I think it was assignment one. <laughs> so yeah, great. No pressure, uh, Daniel and Davo, and we'll go to another question in the meantime. Uh, Abel is wondering, do the NIST standards apply globally? Um, so the, the NIST standards are US-based standards, um, but they are absolutely, um, they, they absolutely apply globally. Um, there are many organizations, some very large that I know in Australia that I've worked with that have adopted um, NIST standards. So the NIST cybersecurity framework has been adopted by them. Um, obviously, I can't say who they are, but um, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and the great thing about the NIST standards um, is that they are free. So you could just go get them from NIST.gov. Uh, was it us.nist.gov, whatever it is. Um, so yeah, they, they definitely apply. Um, and obviously, you know, since then, you know, the Australian um, Cybersecurity Centre is starting to release some similar stuff, but um, but yeah, I, I'm gonna say with that, yes, they do apply globally. As Alex points out, adhering to the standards is not free. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. <laughs> um, uh, well, unless you already have this stuff, maybe, you know. I'll yes. try. I'll try and answer one uh, from Halo. What's the difference between two FA and MFA? Two FA is two factors, and MFA could be any number of factors of authentication. You, yeah, I mean, used interchangeably at those terms. I think many people will say two FA or MFA or you know whatever. But yes, that is. Yeah, guys, got that one. Um, two will usually two will usually imply two, um, and then yeah, I think that's kind of an older sort of term. And now people say MFA. Yeah, and I can't tell you all how frustrating I find multi-factor authentication because it relies on two of my things working at once, as I was saying to Hannah earlier. And it's and not leaving your phone at home. Yeah, and all those sorts of things. Uh, often I have to borrow my sister's smartphone just to like do things. It's quite upsetting. Anyway, uh, Luddites aside, uh, we've got some <laughs> answers from, I'm not really, but close enough. Daniel uh, says that the... Um, Where's Rudy's question? Where did I put Rudy's question? It was probably answered. Well, both your students were wonderful students, which means you must have been a wonderful teacher because uh, Daniel said they are terrible when speaking about access. No, damn it. What was the question? What was the question? Oh, Ed's question. How secure are native browser password vaults? Daniel says, they are terrible. My USB password fetcher was able to extract all the passwords in seconds. And Davo said, I used a DigiSpark keyboard input for mine with a command and control server. And yeah, that might have been about something else. Scary people in that class. To <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean I, that in a really nice way. <laughs> yeah, IT516, is that hacking countermeasures? Yes. Oh, based on the certified ethical hacker certification. Correct. Oh, cool. Well, yeah, uh, so those demos were a little bit, um, a little bit different. Mm. Are you doing that subject again? Yeah, well, it runs through summer though, but yes. <laughs> it's running now. I did literally finish. Yeah, well, next week. So, oh, yeah. cool. Well done, everyone. Uh, all righty. Tim Sulter asks, are passphrases really better or so much less secure? Far fewer combinations for bad guys. A passphrase is really better or so much less secure. Far fewer combinations for the bad guys. Look, uh, so this is a really good question. Um, and, and I think that when, you know, one of the key selling points of passphrases is that um, they can be, so overall, they can be longer. Uh, so the passwords will be longer. 
um, they're going to be easy to remember, which helps um, encourage, you know, stronger passwords because otherwise people just try and, as I said earlier, just try and circumvent, make things simple. So from that perspective, um, you know, they're generally considered better. Um, as long as they're like passphrases that are well constructed, I think. So, you know, just pulling something out of a book um, or a phrase that people commonly use, like open sesame or something like that, is probably not going to be very effective. Um, I use passphrases and um, my passphrases, I can tell you right now, make no sense whatsoever. They are like super duper random. And they're not just like, they don't just use words, like you've got to incorporate other things in there as well. So um, just to kind of strengthen that. Uh, but yeah, I think overall by having longer random passphrases that do incorporate other elements besides just a bunch of dictionary words, um, you know, is going to make them more difficult, especially when it comes to things like, you know, brute force attacks. You know, it's really, really, it's going to be really hard for a brute force attack to, to break something that big um, in, a, in a decent amount of time. Um, obviously, if it gets fished or it's in a credential breach, well, that's kind of the end of it. And they're just as useful as bad passwords because <laughs> they're known. Beauty. There you go. Uh, oh, and I'll, now I'll go uh, top to bottom because um, these are all the older ones through the night. And another one from Rudy, uh, who presumes that TCP would be preferred over UDP for mission critical applications. Is this the case? And if so, why? Um, it would depend. Um, I, I, it would really depend. I think it would depend on um, what it is. So a mission critical application might still need UDP um, depending on, you know, maybe there's performance factors and maybe there is some tolerance to packet loss. Um, you know, for example, streaming videos might be considered mission critical for an organization, um, but, you know, at the expense of it running really, really poorly because it's using a, you know, using TCP, then they probably wouldn't want to do that. Um, I think where there's a requirement for reliable connections, um, which might be mission critical, you know, where it needs, there needs to be some sort of almost guarantee that packets have been transmitted and that there's no tolerance for loss, then TCP would be preferred. So I think it depends. As usual. Give me rules to live by, George. Um, Amelia says there is a feature in Wireshark that allows you to play back a VoIP stream. It seems relatively easy to capture and play back VoIP calls. Will it capture and allow playback if, or, or uh, not just in this feature in this application, but would those sorts of things uh, be able to capture and allow playback if it's encrypted voice like SRTP? I should know this because um, I did a lot of work with um, encrypted voice before and I, from memory, I think you need to decrypt it. I'm pretty sure you can't, um, you can't, actually I'm almost certain you can't play it back while it's encrypted. I'm 99.99% I'm sure. So you'd need to decrypt it and capture it, uh, to decrypt it before you can play it back. Otherwise then would, what would kind of be the point? <laughs> So, um, yeah, so you need to do some sort of, um, you know, SSL decrypt function. Really, thank you. All right. Uh, as I fumble for the mute button, uh, Philip wonders what the difference is between TLS 1.0, 1.2, If you're asking what the actual difference is, I'm going to say I wouldn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. um, only that, you know, their, their version numbers. So there is going to be changes. There's going to be fixes to vulnerabilities. Um, there's going to be improvements. I mean, that's, that's, that's what the difference is. I mean, fundamentally they the purpose of them is to do the exact same thing. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, uh, you know, for, for, you know, securing traffic, so the encryption. Um, but yeah, it's going to be just, you know, I'm going to say usual versioning type stuff. So, you know, bug fixes, Mm. vulnerability fixes, enhancements. Yes. Besides saying security fixes in 1.2. Uh, turn the caps off, please, Anurag. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I assume, I assume better, faster, higher profits for all. Um, with the differences, um, Imran is wondering, 
about oh here we go uh, no no he answered a question from before yeah, yeah beauty this is great uh well let's just go for it imran answered the i also old, got the first I, part right it's not backwards compatible it's not directly <laughs> but yeah and IPv4 hosts and routers will not be able to deal directly with IPv6 traffic and vice versa. In fact, there will be extreme difficulties with address allocation and routing if the internet is to continue to run indefinitely using IPv4. There you go. Great. And if you disagree, send your letters to the forum. A couple of questions about TLS to finish off. Uh, if TLS connection starts with the TCP handshake, and thanks for showing us that, that was really interesting. Can you be sure you are communicating with the correct server? Uh, that doesn't, well, it won't work. You, you, you can't have a TLS established before the connection is established. So it, you're going to establish the TCP connection first, and then you're going to have a, a TLS um, uh, handshake happen after that. It, can't, it just doesn't work the other way around. <laughs> so you can be pretty sure. Uh, and so it's a good point. So with TCP, um, the so there's no session ID in TCP. So talking about, hey, communicating with the correct server. So there's no session ID. So the, the way that um, TCP, you know, I guess keeps track of kind of what's going on is using the IP and port. Um, so yeah, but yeah, to, to that question, um, TCP handshake has to happen first. And then it requests the, um, the, the the TLS negotiation after that. Beauty, thank you. And final one, Justine, are APNs part of TLS? And APNs, APN? are we talking about Apple push notifications? Still here, Justine? If not, we got to a fair few anyway. So, uh, so I mean, if it's Apple push notifications, they're not going to be access part point, of TLS. Access, uh, access point names. Access point names. Oh, and, and uh, Justine reckons you already answered it. Oh, okay. Cool. Great. Did I? Good job. <laughs> hey, good job again. Thanks for sticking around as usual for all of those questions. Uh, altogether, we had 45 or so answered or another 20 or so dismissed. Um, and if you had anything that you wanted to get out of this, but you didn't, please feel free to chuck it in the forums um, and we'll try and get to it through the week. Um, they're, they're just going gangbusters. I just couldn't be more happy with how things are going, George. Um, stick with us for next week. Um, I'll talk about CSU then. I, I promised I'd do it in week two and then of course went away uh, and I'll do it right at the very end. Um, because we have to. Um, so yeah, if you're desperate, uh, just get in touch. Um, I'm sure, you know, school starting soon for some of you uh, or could start if you wanted it to. And that's the, the sales team's job, not mine. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, get in touch with them if you need anything. Uh, what are we talking about next week? Final couple of domains. Uh, three of them, I think. So um, we will be talking about Oh, fun one. Security assessment and testing, security operations and software development security. So security assessment and testing. That's quite yeah, fun that'll there, be girl. fun. That'll yeah. be heaps good. And no doubt so, we'll also have a, a quick chat um, towards the end about, um, I guess, next steps for preparation for the exams for those that want to take it. Uh, yep. I think that might be a good idea. Um, have plenty of time for questions at the end. We'll talk about the course exam. Um, and yeah, um, we'll, I don't know. I'll just... I'm happy to hang around for as long as you need next week. Sounds good. All right. Well, thanks, Sorry. heaps, Hannah and Kit, um, for, for looking after us all and making these short courses possible. Um, thanks, everyone, for hanging around and um, making this such a fun webinar and such a good course to run. It's been really, really collaborative. I'm, I'm liking it. I'm, I'm vibing it, as they say. Uh, and, and George, thank you as ever. I'll leave it to you to, to sign off. Catch you next week. Thanks, everyone. Catch you next week. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am expecting some grand statement. <laughs> well, we did. I had my UDP joke. We did. <laughs> well done. I didn't get it, by the way. <laughs>